coming up next on Arizona Horizon. We'll look at a new report that shows that Arizona made some of the most drastic education cuts in the country during the recession. Also tonight, we'll hear about the controversial practice of pension spiking, and we'll learn about tax filing changes for legally married same-sex couples. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. A new report puts Arizona as the third ranked state in the country in terms of funding cuts per pupil since the beginning of the recession in 2008. Chuck Essex of the Arizona Association of School Business Officials is here now to, to talk about the report and education funding in general. Good to see you again. Thanks for having me. Uh, national report, uh, give us more information. What does this thing look at? Uh, this is a group that, that each year looks at a lot of monies that are spent in different states for supporting children and, st and students. And they've done this same report for a number of years, and it pretty much looks at how much spending authority is available in the different states. And this is the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. What do we know about this group? Uh, they're probably a, a, a group that would be looked at as being uh, uh, in support of more monies being spent and more activities. Uh, services being available to children. So if they saw Arizona as ranked number three, they would say that's not a good thing. That is not a good in okay. their opinion. Okay. And so what did the report find besides the third ranking? What's happening here? Well, what's interesting is that last year at this time, if we would have been talking, we would have been number one in the percentage of cuts, and Alabama and Oklahoma have now moved ahead of us. So at least we're starting to make some progress. But I think people need to put it in perspective that Arizona probably went through the most difficult economic times of any state. So cuts like this were probably inevitable or to be expected. Uh, I have to say, when I saw that Alabama was higher than Arizona, I didn't know that they had money, education money, to cut in Alabama, much less more than Arizona did. But you're saying they spend more per pupil than we do anyway. They do. The only two states that currently don't spend uh, more than we do are <laughs> Idaho and Utah. And we were number one, now we're number three, mostly because of what, that $82 million? because the state legislature started to make some inroads. They did put $82 million in inflation funding. They did put some money in for school safety. So they were starting to move back, but they have a long way to go. And we talk about uh, Arizona, the ranking state by state. Can you compare apples to apples here? Is this the kind of thing where a third ranking does mean something or is it uh, kind of amorphous here? Uh, I think uh, the rankings are very legitimate. Uh, if you look at the state reports from the Joint Legislative Budget Committee, they show if you take state, federal, and local monies and put them together, we're down 17 percent from 2008. So it's, it's almost the identical percentage. As far as the JLBC numbers as well, 25 percent in direct state funding, correct? Uh, but I, I think it's better to look at state, federal, and local together okay. because there is a local districts have a qualifying tax rate and contribute some money. Certainly the cuts to state were significant, but I, I think the best thing is to look at the total number of, of dollars that are available. And, and are we talking capital funds? Are we talking administrative funds? Are we talking bus drivers? What, 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 when what you talk to 17 percent at the state level, uh, that includes capital. Capital. In fact, a lot of the larger cuts were in capital. So it's capital, operational, bus drivers, teachers, and, and but capital has been a major area. Is is this something? Okay, we 17 percent down from 2008. Third worst uh, as far as spending is concerned. Or third best, regardless of how your perspective might be. But are we seeing correlating differences in student achievement and or performance? I think what you're seeing is larger class size uh, because districts can't afford as many teachers. And on the technology side, with the cuts in capital, you're seeing less equipment being available to students. So it's never the amount of money that you spend, it's how you spend those monies. But with less dollars, you have less monies to, to support your program. For example, capital is, in this state is really in trouble. Uh, the amount of capital funding per pupil is, is down, is cut by $230 million, and districts on a per pupil basis have less money, about 50% of the formula money they had in 1998-99, so capital is really taking a hit. How are districts handling that? Uh, they have to. They have equipment to last, to last longer. They buy less equipment that's needed. Uh, they try and stretch the buses out so they last longer. Same thing you would do in your house. And sometimes that's not good, especially in technology where you need to be state of the art whenever possible. I asked if we were seeing correlating drops in, in student performance. Is this an opportunity? I think some see this as an opportunity. All right, the dollars aren't there. They're not likely to be there in the in the near future. This is an opportunity to change structure 
culture, to change paradigms, logistics, whatever the word you want to use, and find a way to make it work better. Is, does that make sense? Uh, I think the idea of making things work better certainly makes sense. But the problem is Arizona has always been a very, very low spending state. And to lock Arizona in at a level that's 17 percent below where it was a couple of years ago when we were near the bottom in the country is not going to provide adequate resources to compete. Uh, with Common Core, our students in Arizona are going to have to compete with students in just about all the other states that are above us. And it's not fair for, to ask the districts and students to compete with less resources available. I was going to ask you about Common Core. How does that change the dynamic? Uh, well, the problem is uh, hopefully the state will pay for the test. Uh, which is part of implementing the Common Core, but then districts really need to up their technology equipment, and right now it's going to be very hard for them to do that with the resources that they have. Is there a movement at the legislature to go in that direction? What are you seeing down? Obviously, the $82 million in inflation spending, we, we saw that. That was helped along by court decision, but we saw that, okay? Um, are we going to see more of that? Well, last session, Governor Brewer and her staff proposed monies to help districts implement Common Core, and the legislature decided not to fund that. They did fund inflation, which was a good thing, but she was requesting additional money beyond that to give districts the support they need to do a good job of getting Common Core off and running. What were the reasons for saying no? Um, I don't know. Yeah. Just like that. <laughs> it's just basically, we, from what I've heard, it's we don't have the money. We can't afford this. Is, is that a valid argument? Well, not, not when you start to look at Arizona and its economic recovery. We're starting to start to, to see surpluses in the, the state budget coming up in 2015 and 2016. And the legislature, I, I, they shouldn't be blamed for a lot of the cuts they had to make during these terrible economic times. But they should be responsible to restore as much resources to districts as they can as the economy recovers. Are we seeing seeing businesses, industry, are we seeing those folks come out and say it? Because we hear that a lot on this program. Well, here, we're not finding enough engineers. We can't find people qualified or educated enough to do X, Y, and Z. Uh, is that message getting to the legislature? And if so, how is that message being received? Well, the message that they should be providing to the legislature is that to balance out, we just, we just don't need tax cuts. We need additional services. We need a more educated workforce. And we want you to fund schools adequately so they, that workforce is available to us. That, that should be important to them, and, and they should express that to the legislators. Last question. What do we all take from this report? Um, that we're making some improvement, uh, but we've got a long way to go to get back to where we need to be to be competitive. Okay, so it's, we're, we're not number one anymore. We're not number one. That's good that we're number three. Um, we ought to, it would be nice to see us each year drop down on that list further and further. Chuck, it's good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Pension spiking is a retirement boosting perk that involves adding sick leave, vacation pay, and other benefits at the end of a worker's career to increase that worker's pension. Phoenix Mayor Greg Stanton says pension spiking needs to end, and the Goldwater Institute has sued to stop the practice in the city of Phoenix. Lori Roberts of the Arizona Republic has been following the issue and then some. Good to have you here. Great to be here. Always a pleasure. Now, let's give me a better definition of what, or is there a better definition of pension spike? What are we talking about here? We're basically talking about public employees who, at the end of their careers, have saved up vacation time and sick leave and other sorts of perks, deferred compensation travel allowances, anything that they have that they can then cash out, they add it to their income, and then their income, the pensionable income, and then that income is what is used to determine their, their uh, lifetime pension benefit. So basically they're taking unused sick time, getting paid for it, lumping it onto their income, 
and raise it, spiking their pension. So this is not the, kind of, not the kind of thing where vacation or sick time ends at the end of the year or the fiscal year. This, this adds and adds, and at the end of your career you go, ba-boom. Right. Public employees don't have a use it or you lose it policy, generally speaking. Generally, they can save up a lot of time. In the city of Phoenix, for example, an entry-level employee gets 40.5 days off a year. Now, some of those are holidays, and so that doesn't count, and, and some of it is vacation. A good deal of it is sick time. You can save those days, bank them every year, and instead of like in the private sector where you would lose it at the end of the year, mm -hmm. they just keep it. And then at the end of their career, they are paid for that time. Interestingly, time that they may um, bank at the beginning of their career when they make, say, $10 an hour, and at the end of their career, if you're like David Cavazos, you're making $157 an hour, all that time that you made at $10 an hour is paid out at $157 oh, an hour, and then on top of that, you use it to artificially bump up your pension. My goodness. Well, let's mention David, get more on David Cavazos. Who is this gentleman, and uh, why is he so much in the headlines? Because uh, how do you get that kind of a gig, too? I mean. Uh, David Cavazos has been a lifetime um, city employee. He's been there for virtually his whole career. Started out as a management intern, making nine dollars, I think, and forty-seven cents an hour. Worked his way up in two thousand nine to become the city manager. Uh, David has been in the news a lot, and David's done a, a number of good things for the city. But where he got in the crosshairs of people is in November, when the city council suddenly gave him a thirty-three percent pay raise. Um, now I don't know how much of a pay raise Channel Eight gives you, but I haven't seen a 33% pay raise. It was also retroactive to, to last July 1st. And you know, it was billed as a way, you know, we need to pay our employees better. This is at a time when other public employees, other city employees, had still not had full restoration of the pay and benefit cuts that they voluntarily gave uh, when the budget was so tight. Well, so, what, what was the reasoning, though? I mean, uh, he did such a swell job? You know, or what? Here's the thing. They won't really say what happened or who initiated this thing. This was done behind closed doors in an executive session. I've asked both the mayor and Sal DeCicio. It was a 6-1 vote, by the way, so most of the city council went along with it. And they all just say, well, he's done such a good job and he's underpaid, so we had to give him this pay raise. So great. You give him that pay raise. Now, a few months later, he uses that to leverage a new deal in a new city because all of a sudden he's now at 52 years old, old enough to retire here, collect his pension here, and then go get another another shot at it in California. And the Republic reported $220,000 a year in retirement only? Oh, sure, because he's used pension spiking and other things to be able to boost that pay. His sick leave and retirement leave, I believe, that he's going to be able to artificially add on to his salary that he's being paid for will boost his... Um, it'll boost his pension to well over two hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah. Two, he may even get to where Frank Fairbanks, the former city manager, was. And Frank Fairbanks, in his pension is forty six thousand dollars greater than the pension of retired United States presidents. And back to Cavazos. And he's got a new job. Got a new job. He was able to go over to California, the city of Santa Ana, and leverage you know, the pay raise he got here to give him that same pay raise there, plus other perks. Plus, he'll be collecting his pension, which will be well over 220000 I would think, probably closer to two hundred and fifty. dollars wow. Again, again I, I need to know where, where I can get this kind of a gig, because this, uh, this is real money here. This isn't fooling around. Well, and, and the thing is, is that you're going to see the, the Goldwater Institute is suing the city, saying, you know, pension spiking is illegal. And I have checked with the, the state pension systems, ASRS, PS, PRS. Yes. Um, it's illegal for them. Now, the question is, is it illegal for the city to do it? And that's what we'll find out in the courts. Is, now, is the city of Phoenix the only municipality doing this? Are other cities doing this? I am this? not aware of any other cities that are doing pension spiking. There may be some. I am not aware of it. Um, and the other thing I think that you need to mention is Greg Stanton now says pension spiking needs to end. Yes. But he, and he's talking about for the, the um, police and firefighters and for the uh, uh, well, basically, and for Cavazos, whoever takes Executive, over Cavazos' yeah, yeah. job. Remember two things. Number one is that's what he said during his 2011 campaign for mayor. And now we're into 2013, and he hasn't done it yet. So I would question, if it needs to end, why didn't it end two years mm -hmm. ago? And secondly, he's not talking about ending it for other city employees. The city last year did cap the amount of uh, sick leave that that city employees can use to spike with, but they haven't ended the practice. Sal DeCicio and some of the other councilmen want to have a vote pretty soon to end all pension spiking for all employees when this next contract, when their current contract ends on June 30th. 
So look for that in the next few weeks to see if they can get that to a vote before the city council. But how do you do that if you've got a bunch of employees right now banking, expecting X because they were promised X, and all of a sudden X is pulled out from under them? Well, here's the way you do it. It's a contract. It's a two-year contract. The contract ends January or June 30th of 2014. So you give them notice now that if you want that to happen, um, it's gonna, it, you better retire between now and then. Uh, I think most of us in the private sector, we went into the private sector knowing that certain things were going to be there for us, and they were all yanked. I think it's sort of the same thing. But anything that they've banked to date, I think that they would get to keep. But if they're still on the payroll July 1st of 2014 under DeCicio's plan, it goes away. That would suggest to me, from a distance here, a mass exodus of folks retiring and getting that payout. I would think if you were close to retirement, that would certainly be what you would want to do. Now, we'll see if it passes. First of all, you've got to get it onto an uh, a, uh, agenda. Yes. And I don't think that the mayor has thus far been willing to put it on an agenda. But I am led to believe that the votes are there to do this because it's just a fundamental feeling among taxpayers of just not a fair deal. You know, we want to, we should pay our public employees well, but nobody expected this sort of huge windfall at the end of their careers. Last question. With this, with compensation in general, we keep hearing that we have, to, that municipalities, Phoenix in particular, has to go in this direction, pay these things, work these contracts, allow these benefits to attract the best and to attract the brightest. Valid? I think that you have to give a fair wage, and we should, because our public employees are important. But I, I think that they carry that too far. And remember, too, that whatever they give, the people that are negotiating these contracts, they also get. Say if a David Cavazos is negotiating the contract for the uh, rank-and-file employees, whatever they get, he's going to get, too. So there's not really a taxpayer um, balance in mm -hmm. that thing for the push and the tug. Um, that's what the city council is supposed to do. They're supposed to be there representing the taxpayers. And I don't think that's happened in the area of pay. All right. Well, it's fascinating stuff. It's uh, kind of like as the world turns there at City Hall. It's good to it have is. you here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Get the inside scoop on what's happening at Arizona PBS. Become an aid insider. You'll receive weekly updates on the most anticipated upcoming programs and events. Get the aid insider delivered to your email inbox. Visit azpbs.org to sign up today. The U.S. Treasury and the IRS have issued new tax filing rules and guidelines for legally married same-sex couples. This after the U.S. Supreme Court struck down part of the Defense of Marriage Act, which defined marriage as between a man and a woman. Joining us now are certified public accountants Jared Van Arsdale and David Walzer. Good to have you both here. Thanks for joining us. Let's talk about what has exactly changed now. for Arizona same-sex couples. What's different? Well, what's different originally is the recent passing of the IRS guidance that allows current same-sex couples that were legally entered into a marriage in another state, one of the current 13 states that allow same-sex marriage that currently reside in Arizona to file a joint return or a married filing separate return. So if you were in a state and you were married in that state legally, you come to Arizona, we don't, we don't do that sort of thing here in Arizona, but federally speaking, you can file a joint return. For federal purposes, correct. Okay. For, for, for federal purposes, they will be going forward required to file either married filing jointly or married filing separately. They will, they will not have the option, as they've had in the past, of filing as a single or a head of household. But for Arizona purposes, since Arizona has a constitutional amendment that does not allow the state to recognize same-sex marriages, hmm. 
for Arizona purposes, the law is that they will still be treated as single individuals for their income tax returns for Arizona returns, not for the federal return. You mentioned they can file jointly or, 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 or filing separately as a married couple. What, what, what difference does it make? Well, it makes a pretty significant difference in regards to individuals with different levels of income. Higher incomes might be affected by what's called the so-called marriage penalty, mm -hmm. whereas lower income individuals um, may not necessarily see too much of an individual difference except for the complexities in the filings at different purposes for federal versus state. And that's, I guess that's on an individual basis. You look at the couple, you look at the situation, and you decide which is probably works better for them, correct? But correct. And, and, and we've been doing that for years for... Uh, traditional married couples. We've been looking at whether or not married filing jointly was better than married filing separately. Usually married filing jointly is better, but as uh, my colleague said, there is a marriage penalty and particularly for individuals where both couples, uh, bo both individuals and a couple are employed, they will probably be ha paying higher federal taxes filing a joint return than they would have filing two single returns. Uh, we're talking uh, uh, federal taxes here, gift taxes included, estate taxes, all that sort of thing? A gift and estate taxes, for all tax purposes, uh, a couple that is validly married, whether they are same sex or, or, or not, will be treated as married for, for federal tax purposes. What about legally married uh, same sex couples now filing? Is this retroactive? What about the past year, the past two years, these sorts of things? Well, the current guidance that they provided. Um, puts a date in purpose September 15th in regards to any individual who is currently in a same-sex marriage recognized for federal purposes could file and still file a single individual return prior to September 15th and after September 16th forward they were required to file a married joint. The, in regards to your question is that they, can they go back and file amendments yes. for previous filed federal tax returns and the issue is, is that they can up to the point in which the statute of limitations is still open for those years, which is, in this case, 2010 forward. Okay, so married in 2010, just no big deal until now, big deal. Big deal, yeah. Changes. Uh, it, it, it makes a big difference. The, as far as the state is concerned now, uh, aren't, I, I, I'm lost sometimes when it comes to this sort of thing, but aren't state returns tied somehow to federal returns? And if so, how does that whole thing change? The Arizona return starts with the gross income uh, from the federal return, but the filing status as a, a married individual or as a single individual is not tied to the Arizona return. Some states, that's not the case. Some states, you're required to, to use the same filing status that you did on the federal return, and I, and I don't know how the states are going to resolve that. In Arizona, since we have a constitutional am amendment, the legislature and the uh, Department of Revenue have very limited freedom to address uh, this issue. What about income reported differently between state and federal returns? How is that impacted? In regards, well, you, like David said, that the Arizona state return starts with federal gross income okay, so as your beginning basis. Okay. So you, as you, uh, the Arizona state return does have increases and decreases for certain additions and subtractions that are not allowed or included for state purposes, but it the total adjusted gross income will be reported similarly at the federal level, but may have to be separated at the individual state level, which is still to be determined. And, and with that in mind, now are we talking two versions uh, of the federal returns? Maybe one is married, one is... Uh, uh, the, the answer to that is we don't know. Clearly, since this just came up, uh, the, the software hasn't been written yet. We, we don't know how we're going to do that, but I imagine because they're going to be treated as single individuals for uh, state purposes, we would end up having to prepare a, a single return for them, a federal purpose, a dummy return, yeah. that would then be used to populate that, that state return. Okay, I love that answer because it's, it's, it seems like this is a very vague kind of new area. With that in mind, mm -hmm. this, is, this is your livelihood here. This is what you do. How many questions do you have? What kind of challenge is this for you? Well, I, my particular concern going forward is the dealing with uh, same-sex couples that may be married for federal purpose but filing multiple states. So now not only they're dealing with their current residency but they might have non-resident returns due in other states in which they have to determine whether or not they are be allowed to file a joint, married filing joint, or they're going to have to determine whether they're single 
finally into those state levels. Yeah, same kind of challenges for you, well, I guess. Absolutely, we're a national firm, and, and so we have to track this uh, across all of the, the, the states. Something that is that we haven't talked about yet, but I think is, it might be important to a lot of the employers here in, in, yes. in Arizona. Uh, one of the, the, the changes that's brought about de deals with the way fringe benefits are taxed. A same-sex couple that is validly married, uh, if the employer was picking up a portion of the spouse's health care, for example, that now is going to be treated as tax-exempt income. Uh, for federal purposes, it wasn't before, and so now there's a refund opportunity, and those those employers should be looking at file for refunds. Okay, we got to stop you right there. Thank you both for joining us. We appreciate it. That's it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.